So we've searched the library, we've found sources, we've evaluated them, and we've stored our references in a reliable location. What's next? How do we write a research paper? And how do we write with our sources? Let's talk about the structural moves that are conventional to scientific writing. Because when we understand how these papers are built and what the purpose of each section is, it will help us to navigate the writing process and understand how to incorporate sources into our writing effectively. In this lecture, we'll pay extra attention to introductions and synthesis. So let's start with, what is an IMRAD structure? IMRAD format refers to a paper that is structured by four main sections, introduction, methods, results, and discussion. This is a really common format used in scientific writing, and you're probably all familiar with it. We'll talk through each section to explain its purposes and goals. The purpose of the introduction is to set up your project by establishing a reason that your study needs to be done. You'll make claims in your introduction that are supported by relevant literature. A strong introduction does four things. It establishes a topic and the significance of the topic. Sometimes we refer to this as identifying the problem. Secondly, it provides relevant background for the topic, usually by referencing important or relevant studies. Thirdly, a strong introduction carves out a gap. It identifies a space in which you, the author of the paper, need to make an intervention. And finally, it offers a purpose statement, a declaration of how you, the author, plan to fill that gap you identified. Let's look at a sample introduction. We'll map the parts of the introduction by identifying the main idea of each paragraph. This is a great exercise for you to do with your own sources. Here, I've highlighted the main idea of each paragraph. Notice, by the way, that we typically find the main idea in the first sentence of a paragraph. This is called a topic sentence, and it's a good thing to keep in mind as you write your own papers that you should state your main idea for each paragraph right off the bat. So let's read through these highlighted sentences. The training needed to reach and maintain the highest levels of performance can expose musicians to a wide range of musculoskeletal health problems. Here's number one. Establishing a topic, musicians experience musculoskeletal health problems, AKA, we've got a problem. The next few topic sentences say this. Although there are sporadic historical cases of scientific studies of the health of musicians, the growth of performing arts medicine as a specialty field has occurred mainly over the past 30 years. Down to the next one, the existing research shows that PRMDs are commonly experienced both by professional musicians and by advanced music students. And then at the bottom of this column, Pain as a main complaint among musicians with PRMDs has been investigated mainly in terms of its location, prevalence, and sometimes intensity. These three ideas fall under category two. Establishing background info. What these paragraphs say essentially is, here's how performing arts related health has been studied in the past. Specifically, Here's what we know about playing-related musculoskeletal disorders, or PR PMRDs. Next, outside the performing arts, recent advancements in technology have led to new digital methods of recording pain location and extent. 
Although not yet applied within the performing arts, digital PDs have become an important component in the assessment of pain. Here we have number three. Digital pain drawings have been used in other populations, but not to examine pain in performing artists. So this is creating a gap, recognizing an absence in the studies that have been done in the work that has been done on this topic. And then finally, this study sought to employ digital PDs for the first time in a large scale study of musicians' pain. The purpose of this study was to investigate the location and the extent of pain in a sample of musicians using a digital tablet for PD acquisition. Additionally, the association between PD variables, i.e. pain location and pain extent, and musicians' features were explored. This is a purpose statement, telling readers what this study will do to fill the gap that the authors have identified. So to review, introductions establish the topic or problem. They provide relevant background, they carve out a gap, and then they fill the gap. Your introduction will set up why your particular study or literature review is relevant or needed, and you will primarily use claims based on relevant literature in that section. Your introduction acts as a funnel, taking you from a larger context to your individual project. We can think of an hourglass shape as a visualization. You use your introduction to get to the narrower line of your own research and findings, and then you'll broaden back out at the end of your paper in order to make applications or explain the relevancy of your work. So let's talk next about methods and results. The methods section explains your research process. For a literature review, you'll include information like the search terms you used, the databases you searched, the number of articles you reviewed, your inclusion criteria, etc. You'll use neutral narration here, just a straightforward account of what you did to accumulate and process your source materials. In your results section, you will present the data from your research. Here you will use synthesized narration, or a guided and shaped narration. Synthesis is a concept and writing practice that many students struggle with. So let's take a few minutes to break it down. What is synthesis? I'm going to first explain the concept using cats, and then we'll see how the ideas apply to writing. Let's say that I ask you to describe what you see in this image, and you tell me this. There is a cat with his mouth open, who is brownish with gold eyes. There is a cat who is orange, with his mouth open, with green eyes. There is another cat who is brown, with his mouth open, and blue eyes. Often, this is the way that students want to present data in the results section. They want to list their sources one at a time and comment on each one individually. But this is not a strong method through which to organize or engage with your data. From this example with the cats, you can tell how inefficient this approach is and even slightly confusing. A reader who read this description without seeing the image would have a hard time picturing it. It's too disconnected and reads too much like a list. And of course, it's unlikely that if asked to describe the image, that you would do it this way. Instead, you would see the similarities and differences, you would see the patterns in the image, and you would frame your description around those patterns or differences. Something like this. There are three cats with their mouths open. Two are brown and one is orange. They each have different eye colors, gold, green, and blue. Here, we've written a description that doesn't give each cat its own separate description, but rather treats the three cats as a meaningful composition 
in their relationship to each other. This description gives a larger view. It still includes all the pertinent details, but it puts those details within the context of the whole and recognizes that the details of each individual cat exist in relationship to the details of the other cats. Synthesis involves seeing not just the parts as individual pieces, but recognizing how they come together to make a meaningful whole. Let's look at a lit review so we can see how this works when we're dealing with articles rather than cats. Here's a breakdown of the four parts of the introduction to our sample literature review. Nurses need to be creative for their jobs. This is the topic or problem. Educators can foster that creativity, the background information. But few people have done a systematic review on creativity in nursing education, the gap. So I'll do it, filling the gap. Let's read through this little excerpt, and then I'll show you how the authors have organized the synthesis. Remember, when you're synthesizing, you want to establish patterns as well as recognizing elements that disrupt the patterns. So let's read it. In some studies, teaching and learning in nursing programs involved artistic works, including mask design, creative artwork, and art forms such as music, dance, sculpture, painting, drama, story, poetry, paper, construction, wood, fabric, and other forms. Emmanuel et al. and Holland Mitchell revealed that students had to be creative to develop a design and to choose appropriate materials, colors, and symbols to express their beliefs and values correctly. To complete a piece of artwork during the lecture, the ability to create, analyze, and brainstorm was essential. Both creating and viewing, I was brainstorming for my own artwork. In Lilliman et al.'s study, Students were asked to express their clinical experience through storyboarding, which involved drawing the scenes and writing out critical descriptions. The author used storyboarding to engage nursing students in creative, critical, and reflective thinking. In Newman et al., students played an active role in the teaching and learning process, which was intended to stimulate their creativity in putting knowledge into practice. Two studies adopted PBL. The students in Cook and Moyle study found that the PBL discussions encouraged them to be more creative and to think more. Those in the study by Klunklin et al. revealed that PBL allowed them to think more systematically, creatively, and conceptually. Here, I've marked the individual parts, those details, in pink. And I've marked the elements that make connections moving towards a meaningful whole in shades of orange, and then references to the meaningful whole in yellow. So we can see the parts in pink, the movement to a meaningful whole in orange, and then the whole itself in yellow. So first, in some studies, this is in giving an overarching view. You can see how the authors here are using language cues to tell their reader that they're synthesizing. So grouping together studies that share this concept of artistic work in teaching and learning in nursing programs. Then in orange, we have some connections across different sources. So mask design in Emmanuel et al., creative artwork in Holland Mitchell, other art forms in Haido et al. Here, the authors are grouping into categories similar concepts from across their sources. The next sentence, Emmanuel et al. and Holland Mitchell, I marked in a sort of in between pink and orange because this is more specifically expressing details from these two sources, but still pairing them together to recognize the connection across these two in particular. Down towards the bottom, you'll see that there's more pink. Here, we're diving into the details of the individual studies. So in Lilliman's study, students were asked to this. In Newman's study, students played an active role in 
that, et cetera. And then again, we have an orange moment where we're combining two studies to say these two studies had PBL in common. And then again, moving into specifics to say, here's what was different in Cook and Moyle's study versus the study by Klenklen, et cetera. So you can see how there's a combination, just like we did with the cats, of recognizing relationships and patterns, recognizing commonalities and connections across the sources, while also highlighting specific details from the individual sources, but always seeing those sources within the context of each other. Not three individual cats, but three cats together in a meaningful composition. You can tell by just looking at the highlighting that when you're writing, you'll often want to start with the general, with that meaningful whole, and then narrow down to the more specifics. So set the context for the relationship, for the connections first, and then you can use that same funnel structure that we talked about with the introduction to move into the more detailed moments that you want to highlight from your sources. So to review. The introduction sets up why this study, and it's written through claims. The methods section explains what was done, and it's written with a neutral narration. The results section presents the data, and it's written with a synthesized narration. The discussion section, then, will interpret and evaluate your results. While you use a neutral narration in your method section and a guided or shaped narration in your results section, the discussion section will once again require you to make claims. If you remember, we said that the claims in your introduction should be supported by relevant literature. The claims in your discussion, on the other hand, should be supported by your results section. So the results become the evidence for the claims that you'll make in your discussion. In your conclusion, you'll summarize the previous information you've discussed, and you'll recommend action to your reader. What do you want your reader to do, think, or feel as a result of reading your work? This, of course, brings us back to our favorite topic of the rhetorical situation. Who is your audience? What do you want them to do? If you remember the hourglass we looked at earlier in this lecture, you can see how this structural format works to invite your reader in and orient them to your specific project. Then it allows you to evaluate and apply the ideas, concepts, or information that your project produced.